mute from inside of a dog. Pump sits close to me and quietly pants, gazing at me. She wants something on our walks, she tells me when we've gone far enough. She is ready to go back. She hops up, pivots on her rear legs, then beelines back from where we came. I turn on the bathwater, turn to her with a smile, and her tail drops and wags low, her ears flattening on her head. All this talking, and yet no talking at all. There is a certain poignancy in describing animals as our dumb friends, and noting the blank bewilderment of a dog, and nodding at their uncommunicating muteness. These are familiar ways of talking about dogs who never respond in kind as we speak to them. No small amount of dog's whiz winsomeness is the empathy that we can attribute to them as they silently contemplate us. Still, these characterizations, while evocative, seem to me to be outright flawed in two ways. First, it is not the animals who desire to speak and cannot. I suspect... <coughs> Excuse me. I suspect it is that we desire them to talk and cannot affect it. Second, most animals, and dogs in particular, are neither blank of expression nor, in fact, mute. Dogs, like wolves communicate with her eyes, ears, tail, and very posture, far from pleasantly silent. They squeal, growl, grunt, yelp, moan, whine, whimper, bark, yawn, and howl, and that's just in the first few weeks. Dogs talk, they communicate, they declare, they express themselves. This comes as no surprise, what is surprising is how often they are communicating and in how many ways. They talk to each other, they talk to you, and they talk to noises on the other side of closed doors or hidden in high grasses. This gregariousness is familiar to us. Having a large roster of communications is consistent with being social, as humans are. These canids, such as foxes, who do not live in a social group, appear to have a much more limited range of things to say. Even the kinds of sounds foxes make are indicative of their more solitary nature. They make sounds that travel well over long distances. Dogs' staunch unmuteness is expressed through making sounds bellowed and whispered. Vocalizations, scent, stance, and facial expression each function to communicate to other dogs, and if we know how to listen, to us, out loud. Two human beings stroll through a park chatting. They move with ease from commenting on the warmth of the air to the nature of humans in positions of power, to expressions of mutual adoration, to reflections on past expressions of mutual adoration to admonishment, to observe the tree straight ahead. They do this primarily by making small, strange contortions of the shape of the cavities of their nose, of their mouths, the placement of their tongues, by pushing air through the vocal tract and squeezing, squeezing or widening their lips. Theirs is not the only communication going on. Over the course of a walk, the dogs by their sides may scold one another, confirm friendships, court each other, declare dominance, rebuff advances, claim ownership of a stick, or assert allegiance to their person. Dogs, like so many non-human animals, have evolved innumerable non-language-driven methods to communicate with one another. Human facility at communication is questionable. We converse with an elaborate, symbol-driven language, quite unlike anything seen in other animals. But we sometimes forget that even 
non-language using creatures might be talking up a storm. What animals have are whole systems of behavior that get information from a sender, a speaker, to a recipient, the listener. That is all that is needed to call something a communication. It needed to be important, relevant, or even interesting information. But between animals, it often is. Communication is only sometimes within our range of hearing or even vocal. It is often made through body language, using limbs, head, eyes, tails, or the entire body. Or even through such surprising forms as changing colors, urinating and defecating, or making oneself larger or smaller. We can spot a communication by noticing if, after one animal makes a noise or does an action, another responds to it by changing its behavior. Information has been imparted. What we'll miss, since we don't know the language of, say, spiders or sloths, though there are currently researchers trying to learn these communication systems. In these utterances that fall on deaf ears, still animals are constant gabbers. The discoveries of natural science over the last 100 years have shown us the variety of guises in which this gabbing can appear. Birds twitter, peep, and sing songs. So do humpback whales. Bats emit high-frequency clicks. Elephants, low-frequency rumbles. The wiggling dance of a honeybee communicates a direction, quality, and distance to food. A monkey's yawn conveys a threat. A firefly's flashes indicate his species. A poison dart frog's coloration identifies his toxicity. The kind we notice first is the one that most closely matches our own language. Communication out loud. Dog-eared. Thunder outside, pumpernickel's ears, velvet equilateral triangles that fold perfectly along the side of her head. Brick into long isosceles, heads up, eyes to the window, she identifies the sound. A storm, a frightful thing. Her ears pivot back, flattened along her skull, as if to hold them shut by their own force. I coo to her consolingly and watch her ears for feedback. The tips soften, but she relaxes only slightly, still holding them tight against the roar. Without prominent ears ourselves, we can envy dogs, proud ears, they come in a dazzling array of equally adorable variants. Extremely long and lobular, small, soft, and perked, folding gracefully alongside the face. Dog's ears may be mobile or, or rigid, triangular or rounded, floppy or upright. In most dogs, the pinna, the outer, visible part of the ear, rotates to better open a channel for the sound source to the inner ear. The practice of cropping ears, severing the pinnae to make floppy ears stand upright, long mandated in many breed standards, is becoming less popular. This designing of dogs, sometimes defended as reducing infections, has unknown consequences in auditory sensitivity. By natural design, dogs' ears have evolved to hear certain kinds of sounds. Happily, that set of sounds overlaps with those we can hear and produce. If we utter it, it will at least hit the eardrums of a nearby dog. Our auditory range is from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, from the lowest pitch on the lowest organ pipe to an impossibly squeaky squeak. In reality, few people hear equally well across the spectrum. With age, the higher frequency sounds above 11 to 14 kilohertz go undetected by the human ear. This knowledge prompted the inspired design of a product with the teenager's umwelt in mind. The device emits a 17 kilohertz tone out of the range of most adults hearing. 
but unpleasantly audible to youngsters. Shop owners have used it as a teenager repellent to discourage loitering around their businesses. We spend most, most of our time straining to understand sounds between 100 hertz and 1 kilohertz, the range of any interesting speech going on in the vicinity. Dogs hear most of what we hear and then some. They can detect sounds up to 45 kilohertz, much higher than the hair cell cells of our ears bothered to bend to. Hence the power of the dog whistle, a seemingly magical device that makes no apparent sound and yet perks the ears of dogs for blocks around. We call this sound ultrasonic since it's beyond our kin but it is within the sonic range for many animals in our local environment. Don't think for a moment that apart from the occasional dog whistle, the world is quiet for dogs up at those high registers. Even a typical room is pulsing with high frequencies, detectable by dogs constantly. Think your bedroom is quiet when you rise in the morning? The crystal resonator used in digital alarm clocks emits a never-ending alarm of high-frequency pulses audible to canine ears. Dogs can hear the navigational chirping of rats behind your walls and the bodily vibrations of termites within your walls. That compact fluorescent light you installed to save energy, you may not hear the hum, but your dog probably can. The range of pitches we are most intent on are those used in speech. Dogs hear all sounds of speech. They are nearly as good as we are at detecting a change of pitch. <coughs> Excuse me. Relevant, safe for understanding statements, which end in a low pitch, versus questions, which in English end in a raised pitch. Do you want to go for a walk? With the question mark, this sentence is exciting to a dog with experience going on walks with humans. Without it, it is simply noise. Imagine the confusion generated by the recent growth of up-talking speech that ends every sentence with the sound of a question. If dogs understand the stress and tones, the prosody of speech, does this hint that they understand language? This is a natural but vexed question, since language use is one of the most glaring differences between the human animal and all other animals. It has been proposed as the ultimate and comparable criterion for intelligence. This raises serious hackles in some animal researchers. Not thought of as a hackled species, ironically, who have set about trying to demonstrate what linguistic abilities animals have. Even those researchers who may agree that language is necessary for intelligence have nonetheless added reams of results to the growing pile of evidence of linguistic ability in non-human animals. All parties agree, though, that there has been no discovery of a human-like language, a corpus of inf infinitely combinable words that often carry many definitions, with rules for combining words into meaningful sentences in animals. This is not to say that animals might not understand some of our language use, even if they don't produce it themselves. There are, for instance, many examples of animals taking advantage of the communicative style system of nearby unrelated animal species. Monkeys can make use of nearby birds. Warning calls of a nearby predator to themselves take protective action. Even an animal who deceives another animal by mimicry, which some snakes, moths, and even flies can do, is in some way using another species language. The research with dogs suggests that they do understand language to a limited degree. On the one hand, to say that dogs understand words is a misnomer. Words exist in a language which itself is product of a culture. Dogs are participants in that culture on a very different level. Their framework for understanding the application of the word is entirely different. 
There is no doubt more to the words of their world than Gary Larson's far side comics suggest. Eat, walk, and fetch. But he is on to something, in so far as these are organizing elements of their interaction with us. We circumscribe the dog's world to a small set of activities. Working dogs seem miraculously responsive and focused compared to city pets. It is not that they are innately more responsive or focused, but that their owners have added to their vocabularies types of things to do. One component in understanding a word is the ability to, to discriminate it from other words. Given their sensitivity to the prosody of speech, dogs do not, always, do not always excel at this. Try asking your dog on one morning to go for a walk. On the next, ask if your dog wants to snow 40 locks in the same voice. If everything else remains the same, you'll probably get the same affirmative reaction. The very first sounds of an utterance seem to be important to a dog's perception. Though, so changing the swallowed consonants for articulated ones and the long vowels for short ones, ma for a polk, might prompt the confusion merited by this gibberish. Of course, humans read meaning into prosody too. English does not give the prosody of speech syntactical leverage, but it is still part of how we interpret what has just been said. If we were more sensitive to the sound of what we say to dogs, we might get better responses from them. High-pitched sounds mean something different than low sounds. Rising sounds contrast with falling sounds. It is not accidental that we find ourselves cooing to an infant in silly, giddy tones called motheries and might greet a wagging dog with similar baby talk. Infants can hear other speech sounds, but they are more interested in motherese. Dogs, too, respond with alacrity to baby talk, particularly because it distinguishes speech that is directed at them from the rest of the continuous yammering above their heads. Moreover, they will more easily, they will come more easily to high-pitched and repeated calls, requests and to those at lower pitch. What is the ecology behind this? High-pitched sounds are naturally interesting to dogs. They might indicate the excitement of a tussle or the shrieking of a nearby injured prey. If a dog fails to respond to your reasonable suggestion that he might come right now, resist the urge to lower and sharpen your tone. It indicates your frame of mind and the, punish the punishment that might ensue for his prior uncooperativeness. Correspondingly, it is easier to get a dog to sit on command to a longer, descending tone rather than repeated rising tones. Such a tone might be more likely to induce relaxation or preparation for the next command from their talky human. There is one celebrated dog whose word usage is exceptional. Rico, a border collie in Germany can identify over 200 toys by name. Given an enormous heap of all the toys and balls he has ever seen, he can reliably pull out and retrieve the one his owner requests. Now, putting aside why a dog might need 200 toys, this ability is impressive. Children are hard-pressed to do the same task and are only sometimes helpful in bringing things back. Even better, Rico can quickly learn a name for a new object by the process of elimination. Experimenters put a novel toy among familiar ones and asked him, using a word he had never heard before, to retrieve it. Go get the snark, Rico. One would be sympathetic if he looked bemused and wandered back with a favorite toy in his chops. Instead, though, Rico reliably picked out the new toy, naming it. Rico was not using language, of course, in the way we, or even young children, do. One can debate how much he was understanding, or if he was even doing anything other than showing a preference for the new object. On the other hand, he was showing an astute ability to satisfy the humans, 
making various sounds by picking up the reference of those sounds. His ability might not indicate that all dogs are so able. Rico might be an unusually skilled word user. And he is. Since the publication of Rico's successes in 2004, other dogs, also border collies for the most part, have been reported with vocabularies from 80 to over 300 words, all names for various toys. You might have one of these progenous vocabularians in your house. Rico is definitely unusually motivated by the praise received on retrieving the right toy. Still, even if he were the only dog who does this, it indicates that the dog's cognitive equipment is good enough to understand language in the right context. It is not only the express content or sound of speech that carries meaning. Being a competent language user means understanding pragmatics of usage, how the means, form, and context of what you say also affect the meaning of what you say. Paul Grice, a 20th century philosopher, famously described various conversational maxims known to us implicitly that regulate language use. Their use marks you as a cooperative speaker, even their express violation is often meaningful. They include the charming maxim of relation, be relevant. The maxim of manner, be brief and clear. And maxims of quality, tell the truth. And quantity, say only as much as you need to. On a good day, dogs mind all of Grice's maxims. Consider a dog who has Espies a roguish looking fellow down the street. A spies. The dog may bark. Relevant, the guy is roguish looking. Sharply, quite ambiguous. But only as long as the fellow is around. So the warning bark is currently true. And not more than a few times relatively pithy. While dogs hardly qualify as competent language users, it is notable not because of their violation of the pragmatics of communication. It is only the smallness of their vocabulary and restricted use of words in combination that disqualifies them. Many owners lament that by contrast to Rico, their dogs are not terrific listeners, despite their broad range of audition. To be fair, canines do not rely on hearing as their primary sense. Relative to even our hearing, their ability to pinpoint where a sound is coming from is imprecise. They hear sounds unmoored from their origins. And just like us, they must bring attention to a noise to hear it best. First apparent in the familiar tilt of the head to direct the ear slightly toward the sound source or in radar dish adjustments of the pinnae. Instead of being used to see the source of the sound. Their auditory sense seems to serve an ancillary function, helping dogs find the general direction of a sound, at which point they can turn on a more acute sense, like olfaction or even vision, to investigate further. Dogs themselves make a variety of sounds across a range of pitches, or differing only by subtle alterations in tempo or frequency. They are downright noisy. Thank you for listening this morning. We're on page 98.